Hi, everyone. My name is um, Steve Wiersma. I'm the sponsor for the Glenbard West Historic Society, and I've been a teacher at Glenbard West High School since 1995. And my guest today is uh, Claudia Finley. And Claudia, um, you and I have, have worked together for uh, many years with American Studies. But um, just tell me a little bit about like about yourself. Like you weren't a social studies teacher right away. You were a a reading teacher, as I, I recall. So just tell me a little bit about like how you found Glenbard West. What's, what path led you there? Well, I actually always wanted to be a history teacher. In fact, I have a little quick anecdote. When I was in second grade my, at St. Charles Borough Middle School in Hampshire, Illinois, my teacher, Sister Marcia, gave me a prayer book. And I think she thought this would be my vocation and I was going to follow her into the sisterhood. Well, she gave me my vocation, but it turned out to be to be as a history teacher because I used to read the prayer book for all the stories about all the saints. I never read any of the prayers. I just read their, their histories. But when I went to Illinois State University, in fact, that was my very first day um, in a convo, the professor said, now I need you to know all of you who are social studies majors, you will never get a teaching job in social studies. You will never get one. So at that point in time, I thought, well, I still have social studies. I really want to get this major, but I'm going to have to find something else. So I had a former teacher, Evelyn Baker at Hampshire High School, who became a reading specialist. And so I kind of turned to her and she mentored me and encouraged me to get my master's degree in reading, which I did from Northern Illinois University. And then when I went to apply for a job, and there's a funny story about this, um, I applied in three different places. One was McHenry, didn't get it. I did go to Bradley Bourbonis, an interview there, and I interviewed at Glenbard West. Well, Bradley Bourbonis offered me a job, and I really didn't want to go there. I wanted to go to Glenbard West, and I still can't believe I had the nerve to do this. I called Dick Stark, who was the department chairman, and said, I got offered another job. Are you interested in me at all? And an hour later, he called back and offered me the job. So what had happened in the interim is he called on my references and they spoke apparently well enough with me that I got offered the job. So that's how I ended up at Glenbard West. So, but tell me like, how did you know, how did you know Dick Stark? Uh, I interviewed with him because Glenbard West was one of the job openings and I don't remember how I found it, probably through Northern, but I, I applied there. I, they called me in for an interview. I interviewed with him and I interviewed with Dr. Elliot. I also have a funny Dr. Elliot story. Um, I interviewed with Dr. Elliot and there are two things that still stand out from that interview all these years later. Number one is he told me I looked like Joan Leslie in my Yankee Doodle Dandy. I didn't know who that was. And the second thing is I had my transcript and I had all A's except one B. So Dr. Elliot scanned the transcript and said, so what's this B? I'm like, that's it. I'm not getting a job here. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, but he still hired me. So it worked out okay. Why did you want to teach at West so badly? Did you know the school or the reputation or the building? I'd seen both schools. I really didn't know much about either one of them. Um, I think I thought I'd have a, a little bit different experience at West in terms of what I'd be allowed to do. At, at Bradley Bourbonis, they were going to lock me into a specific program. And in the West program, I was replacing the previous reading teacher. And I got the impression from the interview that they were going to give me a little bit more leeway than I was going to get at Bradley Bourbonis. So that was a lot of it. I liked the school. I thought it was really a pretty school. I liked the area. Uh, it just seemed like kind of a, the castle on the hill was gorgeous. It seemed like an old established building. It just seemed like a really comfortable place for me to go. And so I did. And I was the first person to teach reading at Glenbard West who was not an English teacher. So that was an interesting experience. But I have to be honest. And in retrospect, I, I wasn't happy at the time, but it worked out well. Um, I think it was 1989. They decided that they would prefer that I teach social studies. And I think our visions of what the reading program was going to be had diverged at that point. And so I did. And it really renewed my career. Uh, Steve, I got to be honest. I don't know that I would have been as happy as a teacher at West if I hadn't started teaching social studies. Because social studies had always been my passion. 
and history had been my passion. And this gave me a chance to take all the information I knew about how to teach kids how to read and, and learn more effectively and gave me a chance to, to go back to the subject I dearly love, which was history. So in the end, it worked out really well. I taught reading for 12 years and history and, well, I'll just, as a side note, I always refer to myself as the utility infielder of the social studies department because I taught all but I think three of the subjects. And it gave me a chance to get back to my true love, which was social studies and history and, and all those things I really enjoyed. And it really worked out well for me. But Gail set a very high standard, not just for us, but for herself. And I think she expected us to do the best we could all the time because she did the best she could all the time. I also think there was an advantage, um, coincidentally, that the Illinois Writing Project started at the same time, and the emphasis on writing in the content areas became a big deal. And I think that really raised the quality of instruction that we gave, because we not only taught the subject, but we taught the students how to write in the subject, and we taught them to be critical thinkers, and we taught them to argue logically a thesis. And I think all of that played in at the same time. And I also think that Gail did a really good job of hiring high quality, hardworking, intellectually curious teachers who all were in the kind of the same mold that we were intellectually curious ourselves. So we conveyed that to the students because if we wanted to know, we wanted them to want to know too what, what the information was. One thing that sticks out about what you're saying is there must have been like some interesting changes like to approach and curriculum uh, with respect to social studies, because uh, I'm just imagining it was a change from facts and dates and people and names to interpretation of events. And so it, it seems like, especially even now, um, the one thing that we want our students to do is to find their voice and to put things together. And um, that I think is, is something that, I mean, am I missing something there? No, I think you're right. I think that there was a shift, at least in social studies, from facts to how do these facts all fit into a pattern? And again, we happen to be fortunate enough that there were trends in social studies nationwide that were coming to the fore in the course of our teaching careers. And we shifted from, well, let's memorize this date to let's see how all of this fits together. Let's see how the political structures of civilizations have evolved. Let's see how the arts have evolved. Let's see the skill development. So we started to see things more as a pattern of a specific type of achievement and how it evolved over time and less as dis discrete, separate events. And I think that made a big difference. I remember when I was teaching toward the end of my career, we were teaching more um, what I would call categorization in terms of these kind of events. Here's all the politics. Here's all the religion. How did this evolve? And I think, and I heard students say, this helped them to see how everything pulled together and how it changed over time. And I think that made a huge difference. Let's just talk a little bit about um, some of the changes that, that you've seen. When did you Come to Glenbird West? I can't remember. 1976. Okay. So, and then you retired? 2009. <laughs> A day that you'll never forget. Um, <laughs> I thought I read in one of the yearbooks or something that the district office used to be in Glenbird West. Do you remember that at all? Right. Where was I that did. located? It was down, um, let's see what's down there now. Health is down there and um, some of the social studies rooms used to be down there. It's that entrance that, it's that one entrance that's kind of on the first floor and you can come in, but it's usually blocked off and you can't get in there. So those are all the district offices. And then they went over to a building on Roosevelt Road. And then they finally were in the Glen Ellen, the old Glen Ellen Public Library. But that, um, yeah, that was kind of interesting. We probably behaved ourselves really well while they were there. Well, we did behave ourselves all the time anyway, but uh, yeah. Um, that was really different and we really needed the space. So we were very glad when they moved out because Glenbard West expanded at the same time the technology came in. And so there was more need for different kinds of rooms at the same time we were having more students and we had limited amounts of places to put them. So it worked out well that the district office was relocated. 
I think the biggest change that I saw was when the Glendale Heights students came in 1982. Prior to that, I'd say Glen Bard West was pretty monochromatic in terms of the student population. And when those other students came in, we saw a big shift, not only monochromatic, mono socioeconomic. And we saw a big shift of students coming in who were from different socioeconomic groups, they were from different ethnic groups. And I think that that changed for the better, the flavor of Glen Bard West. I think it gave everybody a chance to see what real life would be like in terms of the people you would meet in your everyday life. Um, I'm not sure that these students would have interacted in the same way as adults as they do now because they saw students of different groups as young people and learned to work with them and you learned to interact with them. And I think that that was probably the single, and I call it a positive change. And I know that, and I'm guessing now the ethnic pop, um, ethnic mix is probably about 30, 35% minority, a little higher perhaps at West now. Can, can you talk a little bit about what happened with you in the 1980s and 90s and those, those uh, last three decades. In terms of, uh, tell me about your tell me about your story. Uh, were you at, at Glen Bard West during the filming of Lucas during your book? Uh, and then uh, yeah, oh. to tell me about your classroom. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, I was for Lucas. I, I wasn't as affected by that because most of that was shot in the summer. I did go with Chris David one time to be an extra and we lasted half an hour and then I was done. I saw Charlie Sheen though from a big distance, <laughs> like, woo, that was exciting. Um, but yearbook, whoa, that, I have a very painful a memory of that. And the reason it's painful. You've never told me about this at all. I, this is the first time I'm hearing this. Um, one of the students who was profiled was named Rory Rauch. And Rory Rauch had been my student. Oh, you know, he was a lovely young man um, trying to find his way. I had taught several of his siblings. He was from a family of 13. And at the very end, he kind of dropped the ball and didn't graduate. And I remember being upset with him and telling him that. And then two months later, he was murdered. And he was murdered in a particularly brutal way. He was um, got into a fight with an, a gang and they beat him to death. And I think to this day, I, that's probably one of my biggest regrets that I didn't, that the last thing I, oh, the last thing I said to him wasn't more encouraging than it was, but even to this day, just thinking about him hurts my heart. So your book is always kind of a painful memory for me. Um, the other memory I have of your book is that they were very intrusive. I had another situation for some reason I ended up being really inadvertently involved with that program. I had another um, student and they met in my class and I'm like, oh Jesus, this is all my fault. They met in my class, they ended up having a baby and he ended up dumping her. But they ended up being profiled on yearbook too. And so I ended up being interviewed for that. And I remember the yearbook uh, editors kind of wanting to manipulate that situation and being really angry at them. And I saw that a lot. So I thought that program, while it was interesting and it was, I, I kind of wish I could find some of these tapes and watch them again. And there's only a couple you can find. But uh, yeah, I, at some point in time, I remember at some one point in time, I was yelling at a kid in the hallway and I'm really, well, there's a story behind that too, but I was really telling him off. And I looked over my shoulder in the yearbook Fox yearbook office was right down the hall and I look out and the producer's looking out and she's getting ready to film this. I'm like, oh no, no, this isn't happening. And I pushed the kid back in the room. Um, I think it made for a very interesting year. I'm not sure that it didn't make us all a little bit uncomfortable in terms of the fact everything was fodder for being filmed. And I think that put all of us a little bit on our guard. So, and as I said, because of Roy, I, it, it's just, um, it's a painful memory for me. 
so um, let's let's skip out of that because um, there's two stories that we want to tell about how uh, the building was out to kill you. So can, can you tell well, us tell us those stories? The building was out. Fred L. Beaster, the joke my students told was Fred L. Beaster, the ghost of Fred L. Beaster had risen and was out to get me. Um, I had a lot of poltergeist experience at West. Let I don't know if I ever there. told you all of them. Let me just stop there just a second, because um, Fred L. Beaster was our first uh, principal, and he was uh, also superintendent of Glenbard uh, District 87. So I'm going to put his picture up on the screen so people can see him. But I did not know you have poltergeist stories or ghost stories. I think people were very happy when I retired because I didn't destroy the building on the way out. Um, so the very first one was the worst one, of course. And that was in 1988, and I think it was September 5th, if I remember correctly. I, I, I recently posted a picture, which I think you can find. Um, it was the last period of the day, and I was in Mary Kate Bertain's room, and all of a sudden, one of my students said, look at the, steel, look at the lights. Now, this was back in the days when they had the lights, the um, fluorescent lights were hanging from those poles. So it was those bars and they had the poles. So the lights are going, instead of like this, they're going like this. And I still remember it was Robin Turek. I would love to talk to Robin Turek again sometime because Robin Turek probably saved all of our lives. So Robin Turek said, look at the lights and the lights are going like this. And so I thought to myself, those lights are going to fall down. And we had been told specifically, we could not take the students out of the building without permission. We were not allowed to do that. And I thought, I, this doesn't look good. I think, the, the, I think those lights are coming down. So I got them all out. I sent one kid to the dean and the rest of them. And I still can't believe I did this. I took them out to senior circle and I passed out homework. I'm like, all right, you all got your homework. You're sitting in senior circle because the classroom was literally, you could see senior circle from the classroom. I'm going to go in and tell Judith Weinstock, whose room is just above mine, that I think the ceiling lights are going to fall and she better, just so she knows. So I came back into the building and the rumor is, and I don't want to name them, but two people, a dean and one of the other teachers had gone into the room, looked around and thought I was silly that I took the kids out. The rumor is they walked out of it, the room and within seconds, the whole ceiling fell down. And by ceiling, I mean, it was several tons of plaster, live wiring, water, and, and it crushed all every student desk and the only part of the room that was left intact was where the teacher was. I want to tell you just something because um, I thought about this. It, the ceiling at Glenbard West is not like the ceiling in your house where it's made of drywall and if it falls on you, it's a few pounds. It's like literally like almost like cement. It's concrete. When you say several tons, it would, it would be like having um, like bricks fall on your head. It, it's so much and so heavy that, that desks crumpled. Well, and it was, I heard four tons of plaster, but I can't verify if that's the right number. So the, I looked out the window and my students have all now run to the window and, and they were looking in and I'm looking out and I'm like, oh, geez. So I never did get up to Judith Weinstock's room. And she told me later, and I verified this with a couple of her students, including Melissa Williams, who was in the classroom, that the floor just kind of buckled was kind of going up and down. And so they all got out, but the real hero of the story, and he never got, he never got the acclaim he should have gotten was Harry Shoemaker. Harry Shoemaker had the room below mine. And when all of that plaster and wiring and water fell down, it knocked his ceiling down. Now I had about 10 minutes to get my kids out. I mean, my kids were outside looking at their homework and I was inside. He had 30 seconds. Apparently when the ceiling fell, black water was pouring down the side of the walls and he had 30 seconds to get his kids out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the end part of the story, we were out of school for six days. The school board had a meeting and shoot, I should have brought it. I could have showed it to you. I, I have a picture of that online too. Uh, I was called to go to the school board to be thanked so they gave me a crystal apple on a marble base. That was it. That's what I got with a little plaque saying, you know, for your professionalism. And I had to mention Harry's name at the meeting 
to get Harry any recognition, which it really bothered me. I know it bothered him. So, okay. So fast forward, no matter, I think it was only one room that it didn't happen. Weird things would happen in my classroom. The blinds would go up all by themselves. Folders would jump off desks several times. And by several, I mean, at least four or five, either the map rack or the overhead projector screen would suddenly come loose and almost hit me in the head. And that happened a bunch of times. The clocks ran backwards and, uh, and this kept happening. So, okay, fast forward to 19, 2007, where a wonderful man named Steve Wearsome and I are teaching together and we're planning a lesson. Remember, we were planning a lesson or grading papers at the end of the day, Steve, remember? We it was the, the last, last, period, last period of the day. We had American studies and the kids were in the room and we heard, uh, it wasn't a bang, but we something happened outside of it our window. Loud noise. Loud mm -hmm. noise. And um, it was like just a few minutes to the bell. And so it, it was kind of creepy. We, it's like sounds like the, the air the air vents went off or something. So we just we just kept kept teaching. Okay, you tell them you finish it up. All right. So we finished. Everybody leaves. You and I finish up. You head down to your room. I head next door and I looked out the window and there's smoke. But little wisps of smoke. I thought, well, that's kind of weird. There's little wisps of smoke. And then one of the parapros, I wish I could remember who it was, came in and said, you need to leave the building. Packed everything up. I walked down the hall, walked down the ramp, around the building, and into the parking lot where I meet, I met Jeff Lennon. And Jeff said, look at the building. There are five-foot flames shooting up from the transformer that are literally just below the main gas line, which is right outside that building. So I still remember Gail Urban calling me up later that day and, say, and saying to me, you certainly are star-crossed. So, yes, that I was think a, they were very glad when I left. because That was a scary thing was, because yeah. that, tra that transformer was on fire. And like you said, it was right next to the gas main. Those two things were, were together. And so if you go to the building now, obviously the gas main is still there. But the um, transformer got moved far down the hill so that, that would never happen again. But uh, – that could have been catastrophic. It really could have. And we were knocked out of school. We didn't have school for the rest of the week until they, they had to replace the wiring. It knocked out the, um, the fire de uh, detection system at, at West. It, as I said, I think people were very glad that I left while the building was still standing. <laughs> I think they, people kind of thought I was uh, the jinx of Glenbard West. But I, I understand that I'm still somewhat famous for my little escapades too. So anyway, after I left, I guess things were fine, right? <laughs> um, they're pretty good. We have a nice new science wing on there and um, yeah, it's nice. it, the building has just, has never looked better. Um, I was saying this to uh, Mr. Beisner during his interview, but it was designed by the same architects as designed the Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago. And so you have this beautiful building, but with any building, um, if you don't have constant maintenance, uh, things can things can happen, and um, it's it's really never been more more beautiful. For someone who's as introverted as I am, I'm not that outgoing, even though people think I am. It was hard for me to get up in front of a classroom full of of students every day, five times a day, and do what I did. But I think I was blessed, and I just have to put a plug in for my father. I was blessed to have the best role model possible for teaching. And that was my dad, who was actually my teacher for math and music, and who I watched for what? Well, I had him for almost 27 years of my life. Um, for almost 20 of those, or for almost 21 of those years, I watched him come home at night and, oh, this student, and what can I do to help him? Or that student, what can I do to help him? And he was such a tremendous role model of dedication and patience. And I have told my students in the past, I'm not a patient person by nature. You are so blessed that my father was my role model and is watching over me because I am so much more patient with you than I would have been otherwise. <laughs> and I think that I was very blessed to have that experience with him that guided me to be the teacher I was. And I think even though getting up in front of people doesn't come easily to me, I think because I had this wonderful role model, I was able to do it. And I think I was blessed to have students who 
played along with me. Um, I just had a student recently describe me as quirky, but yeah, it's pretty apt. And I think a lot of that, because they, they went along with it instead of making fun of it, made me better. And I also think it helped that I, I wanted to be a better teacher than some of the teachers I had. And I know it's not a very nice thing to say. And I think that made me more conscious of what I wanted to portray to my students and what I wanted to give them. And I wanted them to know I really cared. If the one thing I feel, and I heard Cleveland say it, and I think I heard John say it too. The one thing I wanted all of them to know is I really cared. I might be angry at what they're doing. I might be frustrated with what they're doing, but I wanted every one of them to know at some level that I cared about them. And I wanted them to be the best they could be. And I wanted them to do the best they could for me. And I was invested in them. And I hope, I hope they knew that. I really do. One of the things that I took away being your teaching partner for so many years was something you would say to kids who are kind of like phoning it in and kind of being lazy is you would take them to task because um, you may realize, I, I think you always saw that, look, the kids, they don't know this. This is why we're teaching it to them, but you have to work hard, right? There's nothing wrong with being ignorant. This is what education is about, but you have to work hard. And one of the phrases that I use even today is, you will come up to my standard. I will not lower myself to yours. And I think that really perked the kids up and like, yeah, all right. She, she's calling me out. And I, I just thought that was, um, you had some nice, uh, tough love. And uh, I, um, I always appreciated how you could like be that person, like you are better than this. And they really responded to that kind of, uh, that kind of message. It doesn't have to be all sweet and oh you're good you're good you're fine you're like you're not fine you can do better than this i think it's very motivational uh, can i tell you a little story about why i got like that i went on leave for half a year and i visited a bunch of other schools and i went to evanston and i watched some reading programs and there were some some um black women who were teaching and i watched how they interacted with their kids and it was all tough love and i thought that's, I'm doing that from now on. And I kind of adopted that. And I think it really worked. The other thing I, I, I want to say too, and I've heard this from several students, um, that they felt I was empathetic and that I tried to understand them. And that I, I, I tried, I was kind, tried to be kind to them. I tried to make them feel comfortable. That's probably the best compliment I could ever get. And the other compliment I got that I really, I'm, I, Zach, Zach Cook, I, thank you for saying this to me recently, that I tried to help them see not only my empathy for them, but my empathy toward other cultures and toward other religions and toward other people. So that, so I wanted them to see beyond being an American, that we had commonalities with the rest of the world and that we needed to understand them if we, they were going to understand us. And I really worked very hard at that. And I had several students tell me, several Muslim students tell me, you, you are trying to understand our religion. You are trying to be respectful. And I think it made a huge difference. And I think the fact that I showed respect, I think I got respect. And I didn't do it for that reason. I did it because I genuinely believed that was important. To res I wanted to respect them the way I had wanted to be respected as a student. And I think it made a huge difference. I think it's what it's what made my teaching what it was. So you mentioned you were like a utility uh, baseball player and you taught like almost every single class in social studies. Uh, anything that stood out to you, favorite classes? Well, I enjoyed teaching all of them to some extent. Um, I think my favorites were uh, American law and sociology and world history. But the one I think was the most instructive to me personally, I think I learned the most myself, was American studies. And the reason I say that is because American studies incorporated American history and American literature. And I felt that there was a richness to that curriculum that I, not that I, it wasn't in the other classes, but we didn't have the opportunity. We were able to integrate culture and history in a way that I thought really helped the students understand not only what the history was of their Americanism, what the culture was. 
And I think it put, for me, I learned so much from you and Judith and Gigi teaching that class because I would sit there and listen and think, wow, that literature really reflects this period or wow, that period really reflects this literature and see how, how one influenced the other. And I would sit in class and listen to you teach and go, whoa, I didn't know that. I really wish I'd had American studies. I would have been so much of a better teacher, I think, myself, if I had had that experience, because I would have known how to do that. I had forgotten that you taught that class with Gigi Diasoa and um, Judith Weinstock as well. Well, an interesting story with Gigi. Gigi, of course, was my student. Is and that right? Two students that I had, Pat McCluskey and Gigi Niasoa became my um, colleagues. Pat, of course, taught math, so I didn't work with him. But Gigi and I taught together for two years. And that was fascinating to watch this young woman who I'd had twice. I'd had her in, in world history and I'd had her in American history. Blossom and become this fabulous teacher and this very dedicated professional. And I felt like, again, I would listen to the three of you and I would think I wanted to have that class. I wish I had had that class. I would have understood so much more how all of this fit together. If so what, whatever happened to Judith Weinstock? Where is she now? Judith Weinstock is our school board president or your school board president, rather. Um, although I live in 87 too. She is doing a phenomenal job. I see her from time to time. She is doing really well. Well, I will say one thing about teaching American studies. It actually impacted my teaching in world history um, because I was seeing this, I was getting this exposure to the literature and the history. And then we, of course, would have Mark uh, Dvorak come in and do the music. When I taught world history, I would do music lessons. In fact, I hope John Beisner sees this because my favorite John Beisner story, John Beisner had to sub for me one time. I got sick and I had to go home. And I said to John, I have to leave you this music lesson because it was the lesson I had planned for the day. And I said, now, John, what you do is you play a piece of the music and then you ask them how they feel, what images they saw. And he just rolled his eyes. He's not, not doing that. But I have a feeling he did. And I think I really was a much better teacher because I taught American studies. Well, we did have different uh, things that came into that class, different styles. We uh, had our speakeasy and our, we, were, we would teach the kids how to do the Charleston. And we, they'd all dress up in like 1920s characters and um, they bring in food from the 1920s. So there was an awful lot of that. And so when you talk about some of the uh, ways that like we impacted each other's teaching, that was uh, and, and a good you, example. And you helped, me, you helped me with the mock trials, remember? That's right. That's the right. The mock trials, they would get all dressed up. And uh, for those of you who have never heard of a mock trial, it was uh, it was supposed to be um, a kind of a situation where they had judges and defense lawyers and prosecution lawyers, and we would give them a question. One of them, I think, had to do with the Spanish-American War, something about was the American War, was the United States justified to fight the Spanish-American War? And the students would prep and the judges would prep their little parts and the prosecution would come in with their arguments for why uh, they should have done it. And the defense would say the opposite and they would, they would all come dressed up and they got so into it. And the speakeasy was fun to, as much as I hate to admit it, the field trips hit, were fun most of the time until somebody got sick and I had to sit with them. You were always but on the I bus think, with oh, the sick kids. Yeah. And, and somehow or another you were better, but I, I used to get stuck with the sick kids for some reason, but I really think I really had wished that more classes could be team taught because I think not only was it good for the students to have the exposure to two teachers, but I think we as teachers, I grew from working with you. I hope you can say the same thing about working with me. It was a hundred percent. Like, and not just like uh, things like, um, like units and, and about knowledge, but uh, approaches and philosophies, uh, even saying, you will come up to my standard. I will not be lowered to yours. You know, that kind of stuff, it, it just impacts you. And I never, I never quite um, expected that to happen. And it was a very powerful way of growing as a teacher was teaching with another teacher. 
Well, and I have to laugh because I, you're such you're such a kind, sweet person, and I think they always thought I was the the hard one. We did kind of do the the mom dad role, like you know, don't oh. make mom don't make mom mad. Give it to me. Give me the homework. Don't make mama mad. Yeah, good good cop, bad cop. But I remember one particular incident. I don't know if you remember this. I can't remember what happened, but you were so angry. And you got up there and you just lit into the class. And I was sitting in the back and I can't remember. I think I remember who was sitting next to me. I think it was somebody named Megan. And I remember saying to her, oh, he's really angry. You guys are in such trouble. And I was literally cowering in my chair because I'd never seen you be angry. I thought, Oh, if he gets that angry, you are all in big trouble because you know I get angry, but he doesn't. And you there are were, in trouble. There were 62 kids in one class. They were so oh. wide that when you stood at the front, you could not, your periphery couldn't take them all in. And it was so easy for them to ignore you. I mean, there's one against 62. And it's like at some point, like you have to like show up the class. I'm really sorry though, that they got rid of that class in world studies, because I really thought that those were two of the strongest programs that Glenbard West offered when they offered them. You know what? One in my land and two in my sea, and I on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm. And I really think that there's a lot of benefit cross-curricular, cross-subject teaching because I really believe that it, it broadens the perspective of the students and they learn it in a much deeper level if, if they're seeing two different perspectives of the same topic than they do when it's one perspective and then a separate perspective in another classroom. So what a I, nice visit. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, it'd be good. All right, be safe, Claudia. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.